our final guest this evening is a former host and producer of Tuesday Funk. Since his first publication, since his first publication in 1993, his short fiction has appeared in Salon, Storyteller, Bloodstone Review, Newtown Literary, Asimov Science Fiction, the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, science fiction age, realms of fantasy, electric velocipede, and various anthologies and year's best collections. His work has been shortlisted for the Hugo Award, the Nebula Award, and the Theodore Sturgeon Memorial Award. And his memoir, The Accidental Terrorist, Confessions of a Reluctant Missionary, will appear from Sinister Regard Publishers on November 10th, but you can get it directly from him tonight if you want. Do you have any left? Got a few. Got a few left? Yeah. He currently lives in New York City with his wife and their soft-coated Wheaton Terrier, Ella the Wonder Dog. <laughs> Please welcome back to Tuesday Funk, William Shun. It's good to be back at Hop Leaf. Um, wow, the room is full. <laughs> um, Elaine, I grew up Mormon in Utah, but I think somehow my father and yours are related. <laughs> um, I want to mention I'm going to be doing a, a Reddit AMA on uh, this coming Thursday night from 8 to 10 Central Time in the r slash Mormon subreddit. <laughs> so if you're, if you're online and you want to come ask me anything, please do, because I don't know how many people are going to show up otherwise. Um, and I'm being interviewed this weekend for Wired.com's Geek's Guide to the Galaxy podcast, so I hope you'll watch for that episode sometime in the, in the near future. Um, OK, so. <coughs> This thing happened to me when I was really young. <laughs> you might have heard a little bit about it. If not, I was a Mormon missionary back in the late 80s. I got arrested, charged with hijacking. <laughs> I can't go back to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> and that's pretty much what the book is about. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've, uh, yeah, spoiler alert. Um, I've read a lot of excerpts from this book over the years at this very microphone and in other places around town, so it was a little difficult to find um, an excerpt that I hadn't read here before. Um, so I'm going to read something from near the middle of the book. Uh, I'm a 19-year-old Mormon missionary as this is happening. I'm stationed in a prairie town called Brooks, Alberta. Uh, it's a few days after Christmas, 1986. Uh, and I've been a missionary for all of four months, and I'm just desperate to go home. I, I'm depressed, I can't stand being a missionary, and my companion, Elder Deadman, is what we call the bucket. <laughs> Maybe it's a little on the nose, that's not his name in real life. His name is This is being recorded, you know. <laughs> I'll, I'll edit. Yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, Kyle. Uh, <laughs> so, on Christmas, I talked to my girlfriend back home on the phone, and she made it kind of sound like she'd be okay if I came home from my mission early. That's not really what she was saying to me, but that's what I heard. And so I started, I started making plans to, uh, to make my great escape from Canada. That's, and this is all well before the, the hijacking stuff. So you know that this escape is not going to go very well. <laughs> Chapter 24. <laughs> I haven't even started yet. <laughs> My biggest immediate problem was prepping for my escape without tipping off Elder Deadman. It was simple enough to find a pretext to drop by the library and return my books, and simple also to pull a wad of Monopoly money out of a Royal Bank ATM, emptying my account. Packing, though, was a different matter. Late on Christmas morning, while Deadman was on the phone with his mother, I had started stuffing clothes into my suitcases. 
But it didn't take me long to realize that I couldn't pack everything yet, or the empty closet and drawers would give me away. Until that long weekend, I'd perceived Elder Deadman as a fairly unintrusive companion, one who spent hours wrapped up in his own pursuits and left me to my own devices. Now, though, he seemed to attach himself to my elbow. I couldn't change my tie without him tagging along, nattering on about the Edmonton Oilers or the skiing in Banff for the time he offered a Book of Mormon to a hot babe who gave him her phone number. <laughs> <laughs> on those rare occasions when the bathroom door closed behind him, I rushed like a demon to jam two or three more items into the suitcases in the closet. I tried never to open my drawers when Deadman was around. By 10 o'clock Sunday night, I was ready to bludgeon him to death with his football game. <laughs> He'd been sitting on the couch playing it since 8. The continual bleats tapped at my skull like a jeweler's hammer. I sat in the armchair trying to read until finally its batteries ran down. As I was murmuring a prayer of thanks, Deadman grabbed a fresh pair of double A's from the refrigerator. <laughs> my torment was far from over. At half past 10, having read the same page of John Varley's Millennium at least seven times, I started yawning, deliberately, and did it again every few minutes. After 15 minutes, I upped the frequency. Soon, Deadman was yawning, too. <laughs> I kept turning pages, eyes fastened to the type, with no idea what I was reading. An eternity later, Deadman put the game aside. He rubbed his eyes. I think I'll turn in. Anything special you want to do for P-Day tomorrow? This was uh, our preparation day, the one day a week we got to have some time off and do laundry, maybe. I shrugged. Eat dinner on American soil, I thought. <laughs> Not really, maybe a burger at that place downtown. You know, I should probably hit the sack, too. While Deadman stretched his arms, I stood up and slipped past him into the bathroom. I took my time washing up, scanning the medicine cabinet to make sure all my toiletries and other supplies were bunched together for easy packing. I didn't take out my contact lenses. After relinquishing the bathroom to my companion, I stripped off my sweatpants, tossed them into the closet, and pulled on jeans and a sweater. By the time Deadman emerged, I was in bed with the lights off and the covers pulled up to my chin, fully clothed. Companionship prayer, Elder? Asked Deadman, his voice loud in the claustrophobic darkness. His bed springs squeaked. Elder? I kept my face to the wall and played dead. <laughs> I didn't sleep. I kept my eyes on the digital clock on the dresser, running the remainder of the night's tasks through my mind like a mantra. I tried not to think about my imminent reunion with Katrina, the feel of my arms around her waist, the taste of her sweet breath in my mouth. Knowing a retreat into fantasy was the surest route to drifting off. The minutes dragged themselves by like dying men in a desert but I forced my eyes wide. By midnight, Deadman's breathing was deep and steady, but I gave it another half hour just to be safe. Another eternal half hour. There was too much to do to leave it any longer. I skinned the covers back and swung my legs cautiously to the floor. I slid the closet door open ever so slowly and over several painstaking minutes, ferried my two suitcases and my hanging suits and shirts into the living room. I packed the last of my clothes, then slipped Katrina's photo into my shoulder bag, along with the Opus doll she'd given me. Catching sight of my notebook inside, I realized I hadn't updated my countdown calendar since Christmas Eve, when it stood at 619 days. I'd found a shortcut to zero. <laughs> I put on my sneakers and zipped up my parka. Stealthily, I carried everything up the stairwell to the parking area, my pulse hammering so hard I could barely hear anything else. A sullen snow sifted down, sparse flakes like volcanic ash. I shoved my luggage into the back of the car, disconnected the extension cord from the heater on the engine block, and climbed into the driver's seat. I blew out a short, nervous breath. This is it. I backed slowly out of our spot and shifted into drive, gravel crunching under the tires. As I pressed the gas, I saw a shadow detach itself from the house in the rearview mirror. Huge and dark, it slammed against the back of the car. I yelped and stomped on the brake. I jumped out, heart pounding. I realized two seconds too late that this was a mistake. A fully clothed elder deadman had leaped spread eagle onto the hatchback. <laughs> He pushed off it and planted his hands on his hips. 
Where do you think you're going, he said, not even panting. Shit, I hissed. I wanted to vomit. Away. I turned back to the car, but Deadman darted past me and blocked the door. You think I didn't know you were packing your stuff? You think I'm stupid? I tried to shove past him, but he pushed me back like I was a child. No, tell me where you're going. Home, okay? His brow furrowed. What, in a mission car? Are you crazy? <laughs> of course not, I was going to the bus station. I was gonna leave my shit there, bring the car back here and walk. What's that, two miles? Mile and a half, I said sullenly. <laughs> While someone steals your luggage? What kind of a stupid plan is that? Just let me go. I tried shoving past him again. He pushed me so hard I fell down. No. I climbed to my feet. I'm so sick of this shit. My hands balled into impotent fists. Why don't you just let me leave? He folded his arms. Yeah, right, and what am I supposed to tell the mission president? Tell him I sneaked out. I just vanished. I don't give a shit, just let me go. We stared at each other, me breathing hard. The miserly snow fell around us, the idling car the only sound. You should pray about this, Elder. <laughs> I have. <laughs> then pray with me, companionship prayer, at the church. I'm not asking. Deadman climbed into the driver's seat. Get in. Tears of rage stung my eyes. I looked at my watch. It was after one o'clock, less than two hours to the bus. My guts were in knots. Deadman revved the engine. I sighed and got in. This signals a scene break, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> the lights snapped on in the chapel, chasing shadowy ghosts away. Deadman led the way to the front. Right here, in front of the podium, he said, kneeling down between the dais and the first pew. Come on. Reluctantly, I joined him. I'd been watching without luck for any opportunity to snatch the keys and run. Deadman folded his arms, closed his eyes, and bowed his head. Our dear Father in heaven, we're grateful for all our many blessings, including the gift of being able to serve thee as missionaries. Father, pour out thy spirit upon us to, can, to increase our desire to serve thee and to help give Elder Shun the desire to stay on his mission before he makes a big, big mistake. <laughs> Bless us, please, and watch over us. And we say these things in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ, amen. <laughs> Grinding my teeth, I kept silent. Deadman wore his Mormonism like a ratty old bathrobe. There if you needed to cover yourself, but you wouldn't want to wear it outside. <laughs> I refused to ratify his prayer with an amen. Deadman shifted around until he was sitting cross-legged. His expressionless mask pointed at me. Elder, why did you come on a mission? Flip. I stood up, gesturing as I groped for words. Because, because that's what everyone wanted me to do. My throat tightened. It was the first time I'd said what I really felt out loud. Yeah, me too, said Deadman, looking up at me. But you gotta look beyond that. Why you came doesn't matter. What matters is that you're here. What matters is finding your own reasons to stay. Not anyone else's reasons, your own. Why do you stay, I demanded. You don't do anything. It's like when the apes told us to kick and take. You heard, kick back and take it easy. <laughs> I've been waiting for a chance to use that line. <laughs> Deadman looked at his hands. I'm not such a good missionary right now, I know. Maybe, maybe I just need some help, a little push. What occurs to me now is that the mission field made each of us crazy in his own special way. What occurred to me then was how little I knew about this companion of mine, how little I knew him, how little I had tried to find out. But I ruthlessly stamped out any glimmering of sympathy. I tried to push. Maybe I need you to push harder. Criminy. I turned and walked away. Deadman jumped to his feet. Sean, wait! I stopped halfway up the aisle, throwing my hands in the air. Where can I go? You have the keys. Elder Sean, what's the problem? He pleaded. What's so bad about this? What can I do differently? You can't do anything. This isn't about you. I'm miserable. I hate being a missionary. I don't want to be here. 
I want to go to school and write stories and sleep in my own bed and listen to music and see movies. We can see movies if you want. <laughs> I gave a rueful snort. This isn't what I want, Elder. I want to go home. You really want to go home. I really want to go home. You've thought this through. I've thought this through. There's nothing I can do to talk you out of it. Nothing. We stared at each other across the pews. I refused to look away. Deadman finally nodded his head. All right, man. He rubbed his eyes like he couldn't believe what he was saying. How much time do you need me to buy you? <laughs> Headlights pierced the snow in the distance. Deadman and I stood up from the plastic chairs outside the darkened depot. We hadn't talked much as we waited for, in the cold for the bus to arrive. Listen, Deadman said, hands in his pockets. Did you ever hear about Runaway McKay? <laughs> I shook my head. All I wanted was to be gone. No. He's this elder a few months ahead of me. He tried to go home, too. A couple of things you should know. First is that nickname. He changed his mind, ended up not going home, but the name stuck with him anyway. That's what everyone calls him, okay? I'm not gonna change my mind. Fine. The way the story goes, he was at the airport waiting for his plane when the apes, not our same apes, this was Mason and Sailor, and apes is uh, APs, assistance to the president. <coughs> Two missionaries who were rewarded for extraordinary brown nosing with positions working in the missionary. <laughs> Not our same apes, this was Mason and Sailor. When they caught up with him, basically they got in his face and chewed him out and called him a pussy until he broke down and changed his mind. Do you understand what I'm telling you? The bus pulled in and stopped amid a welter of chuffs and squeals. Snowflakes swarmed like mosquitoes in the headlights. It shivered. Yeah, I get it. I'll try to wait until sometime after noon to call president. That should get you well clear of Calgary before they start looking. Thanks, man, I said, my eyes welling. The driver emerged from the bus. I bought a ticket from him for $18, and he stowed my luggage in the compartment underneath. I shook hands with Deadman, scarcely believing this was happening. You take care, Elder. He crushed me in a quick hug. Go with God, Elder. <laughs> Stepping back, he waved me onto the bus. Maybe a dozen people were on board. I found a seat near the back and slid across the cracked blue vinyl to the window. As the bus pulled out of the lot, Elder Deadman stood watching with his hands clasped behind his back, a desolate ghost in a field of static. We drove on, and the gray noise swirled him to pieces. <laughs> <laughs>